All right. Well, welcome this uh, Saturday afternoon to a totally spontaneous <laughs> study group session. Um, we currently have uh, one person who signed in, which with only 30 minutes notice. What can you expect? But uh, more people might pop in. Um, I just thought that uh, this would be a good opportunity for people, um, if they were available, to jump in, work some problems with me, and uh, uh, do a little uh, preparation for this exam. So the first problem that we're going to go over is the, uh, the, the final trick problem that I posted. And uh, I'll show you where that resides. Um, so when you go to Twitter and you go to Pound Solar Mook, <clears throat> you can see the one of the last posts was to Sarah Raymer, um, who had just solved the trig problem. And uh, I indicate one last trick question. And this one's kind of unique because it combines um, some elements of, uh, of a couple of different problems together. Um, and uh, <clears throat> it may be that you get something as complicated as this on the test, but probably not. But to be sure, if you are successful at uh, solving this problem, chances are you won't have a problem with any other trick problem uh, on the test. That's my, uh, that's my put my neck out there statement. <laughs> and we'll see. Um, okay, so let's capture this. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'll be creating a slideshow in PowerPoint uh, for people that don't want to sit through the long involved uh, verbal explanation. Um, I will uh, uh, have a, a posted slide set as well. So you'll be watching me create the slide that will be uh, um, posted uh, on the website. So uh, we call this last trig problem. Okay. So we've got uh, one last trig question. We are at uh, 40 degrees north. <clears throat> we have a 20 degree tilt to the module. Uh, I'm going to mark up the screen a little bit just because just because I can. <laughs> got my handy dandy pin here. So we've got a 40 degree north latitude. Okay. So, so the chart that we're going to be using for the sun path chart will be the 40 degree north chart. We've got a 20 degree tilt on the modules, and that's relative to the rooftop. Okay, um, the modules themselves are 24 inches wide. Okay, so uh, you can just assume in this question that that's the landscape uh, layout of the module, um, and uh, and we're putting these modules on a 412 pitch rooftop. Okay, so this is new. Um, you know how to solve for the pitch angle of a 412 roof um, utilizing the arc, arc can function. We've gone through that before and we'll, we'll do it again on this problem. Uh, but you maybe not know how to, do not know how to uh, account for the uh, roof's pitch when you've got a pitch also on the module and you're concerned about row shading, shading between rows between a specific uh, uh, time of day. So we don't want any shade between 8 and 4 p.m. So because we haven't specified a date, we need to assume that it's the shortest day of the year, which is the winter solstice, December 21st. Um, so we need to figure out how far apart must these rows be. Okay? So let me erase all this and jump into PowerPoint. And create another slide, new slide, uh, title only. So uh, let's grab a triangle here, okay? Um, we need to establish some knowns, all right? Um, 
We have a right triangle. Okay. So we know that we're dealing with a let me format this triangle as well. Format no fill. Line can stay green, I suppose. I'm going to that is the ball shape. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so what do we know about this triangle? And the triangle that we're, we're solving for here has to do with the uh, the, the height of the modules. Okay. Um, oh, looks like we may have somebody who joined in, possibly. Refresh. Yeah, this is Samson. I'm sitting here now. Hey, there you are. Welcome. It's just you and me, Samson. <laughs> yes, I tried now. I <laughs> managed it. Okay, well, I was just going through the explanation. But I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, good. Yes, I hear you, yes. Good, good. I hear you, too. So I'm just uh, going through the explanation yeah. on this uh, this problem. Okay. So, uh, hello. Hello. You're breaking up just a little bit, but uh, if you can hear me, we can. Uh, we can. Uh, I can move forward. Yes, I can hear. Okay. All right. So I'll go ahead and uh, uh, keep describing this problem. So, um, okay. what do we know about this module? We know that it has a 20 degree tilt, okay? So uh, relative to the rooftop. So we'll put 20 degrees right in here, okay? 20 degrees, go up eight. Okay, and we know that it has a 24 inch width. Okay, 24 inch width. So what we don't know then is how far back is this okay so we're trying to solve for the height of the module okay because we're concerned about the spacing between the rows of the module all right so when we know that we know the hypotenuse which is 24 degrees and we know the angle which is excuse me 24 inches and we know the angle which is 20 degrees and we're trying to solve for the opposite, which is opposite of the angle over here, um, then we know we need to use the sine function. Okay? So I'm going to head, I'm going to go ahead and duplicate this side slide. Uh, so Mandy. Come down here and I'm going to select all of this and move it over a little bit. And then I'm going to uh, insert object Microsoft Equation, and here we're going to, to build our equation. So we know the sine of the angle theta, I'll go ahead and grab the theta symbol here, sine of the angle theta is equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse. Hypotenuse. Asante kwa kutumia mtandao wa Vodacom. Simu yako imesitishwa na mteja. Tafadhali subiri na atakuunganisha tena. Thank you for using Vodacom network. Your call has been placed on hold. Is that you? Sam? Samson? I'm going to go ahead and mute you now. Face that with Okay. All right, I'll, I'll move forward. Um, okay, so we have a sine of uh, 20 degrees is equal to the opposite. Oops, get this right. The opposite over 24 inches. Okay, which means the sine of 20, which is uh, Grab my calculator here. Okay. So we type in 20 and then we punch in sine. 
and it looks like we're at uh, point three four two. We'll just say point three four two is equal to the opposite. That's right. I'll get faster at this. Just the sad patience. Over twenty four. <clears throat> which, when you multiply both sides by 24 inches, we get 24 times 0.342 is equal to the opposite. Which means that 0.342 times 24 is equal to 8.2 inches. Okay, so 8.2 inches is equal to the opposite. All right, so grab all that. Control C, close X, and there we have it. We have now determined what the opposite side is. So go ahead and Command Shift V. So now we know that the height of the back of the module is. 8.2 inches. Okay. Let's see. So, going back to our original question, I'll just go copy, bring it back down here, paste. So, now we've got a 20 degree tilt module, which is 24 inches wide. It's on a 412 route roof with no shade, okay? So what we need to determine now is what is the angle of a 412 roof, okay? So to determine the angle of the 412 roof, new slide, add a little angle of a 412 roof. All right, so we know that 412 is the rise over the run. So looking at that as a triangle, we see that uh, we've got uh, this is the run, and it's 12 inches, and this is the rise, and it's 4 inches. Okay, so that's rise over run, all right? So we have the opposite and we have the adjacent. So if the tangent of the angle theta is equal to the opposite over the adjacent, okay, then the tangent of the angle theta is 4 divided by 12. So... 4 divided by 12 is equal to 0.33, okay? So that is the actual tangent of the angle theta, is 0.3333. Um, now, to translate that into um, something that we can, uh, that, that's into an actual degree, an angle degree, we use the arctan function, okay? So the arctan function requires that we do a shift and use the tan to the negative one. So the pitch of this roof is 18.4 degrees, okay? That is our roof pitch. So let's see. I'll go back and dress up these slides a little bit so they're more comprehensive for anybody who goes through this just looking at the slides. Um, all right, so let's uh, generate a new slide here. Okay, new slide, add only, and here's a new shape, and it is a triangle. Okay, so here's our roof. Okay, <clears throat> all right. And we'll say that uh, 
from our calculation, this is our 812 pitch roof. We know that we've got 18.4 degrees. Okay. All right. We also know that we're dealing with modules on the rooftop that uh, have their own special issues. Let's see if I can get this to line up properly. Hey, is that Josh? Okay, how's it going? <laughs> okay, great. So this this works out. Um, I'm just kind of randomly and formally going through some you know uh, problems. Uh, I was going to do the uh, the trick problem that I posted on uh, Twitter, uh, which I think we've kind of uh, beat that horse to death. But this is the uh, the last one. <laughs> <laughs> we can move on to some other stuff. And then I was going to go through explanations of some of the problems um, that are uh, in the NAVSEP study guide, or the resource guide, the case study, and then the, uh, the nine or ten retired NAVSEP test questions. So, does that sound good? Okay. You sound like you're pretty far away. Um, you must be talking through a speakerphone like I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we are. Yeah, we're actually in a conference room with several of us, so we're trying to manage as best as possible. I think that's as loud as we get. Okay, no, that's that's good. That's good. And uh, you know, if you have any comments or uh, uh, questions, you know, uh, I'm here. Okay. Right now, I'm. Uh, this is kind of a slow process. I'm 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 building the slide sets as I. Go through the go through the question, so have patience with me. <laughs> okay. Are you guys all taking the test? Yeah, we are. All right. Okay. All right. So let me close this here and <clears throat> so we're trying to uh, determine the row spacing on a on a pitched roof at a particular point in time okay so um, if we're dealing with the roof that has a uh, uh, eighteen point four degree pitch, and we're trying to determine how long is the shadow going to be uh, from the sun at a particular point in time um, on a specific day of the year. We need to uh, basically take the sun path chart for that, uh, for that latitude, which is 40 degrees north, we pull that up. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So here's the sun path chart for 40 degrees north. And we are concerned with a very specific point in time, which is 4 p.m. 4 p.m. right there. <clears throat> Uh, and we're dealing, we're trying to determine what the altitude angle is at that time, and I'm going to say that that's about six degrees altitude angle. All right? So, six degree altitude angle means that the sun is coming across. I'll go ahead and try to draw a line here. Okay, and we will put shape here, 
shape. Um, all right. <clears throat> so to determine the shadow length, we get one more bit of information in here. Um, I'll actually have to jump back and see how tall that was. 8.2 inches. Okay. 8.2 inches. 8.2. Okay. <clears throat> 8.2 inches. So um, we're trying to find the length that is this distance between the two. Okay, um, and to be clear, this is a profile view, um, which means that we'll be uh, uh, taking this length at uh, an angle. Well, actually, let me just uh, uh, clarify by saying this is the shadow length at this particular time of day. Um, so, in order to calculate that, we actually have to uh, uh, make an adjustment to the uh, to the six degrees that we see uh, here. Okay, so while it's uh, six degrees relative to the horizontal, if you are on a rooftop that is pitched at 18.4 degrees, then from the rooftop's perspective, um, you need to add 18.4 degrees in order to uh, 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 utilize that that uh, chart um, uh, to, to to make it work. In other words, <clears throat> we need to add 6 degrees to the 18.4 degrees so that it looks something like, let me try to grab all this, okay, Just command D, right, and let's see if I can get all of that, okay. I uh, won't be able to get that to work. All right, I'm going to have to manipulate this uh, image for a little bit to kind of give you an idea. But uh, basically, we're bringing this angle down 18.4 degrees <laughs> so that we can bring this angle up. 18.4 degrees. Okay? So I'll try to illustrate it on the next page. New slide. Add only. So now what we're dealing with is let's see. We're basically flattening out the equation such that <clears throat> the angle now here between the two uh, so instead of the altitude angle being six degrees the altitude angle is 6 plus 18.4. So now we're dealing with a 24.4 degree altitude angle. Okay? So if we know that, get that centered in here. <clears throat> so if we know that the size is 8.2 inches, okay, and we're trying to solve for the adjacent, which is the length of the shadow here, okay, um, we would need to use we have the we have the opposite, and we need the adjacent. So we're expected then to use the tangent function. Okay, so we'll insert object 
X dot equation. I know this is kind of like in slow motion. <laughs> I hope it's not too unbearable. <laughs> Tangent of the angle theta is equal to the, op the opposite. over the adjacent, which means the tangent of 24.4 degrees is equal to the opposite, which is 8.2 inches, 8.2 inches over the adjacent, okay, which means that the tangent of 24.4 24.4 tangent, 0 0.4536, 0 0.4536 is equal to 8.2 inches over the adjacent, which means you multiply both sides by adjacent and multiply both sides by 0.4536 basically algebraically switch things around, okay, we get 8.2 inches over 0.4536, which the answer to that question is 8.2 divided by 0.4536. Is equal to adjacent is equal to eighteen point zero seven seven. Okay, so <laughs> that is the length of the shadow at four p.m. on the shortest day with a twenty degree tilt module that's that's on a um, okay. <laughs> So, uh, hey Josh, yeah. I, I made a mistake in my calculation here. I guess this is why I should build the slides before I try to go through them. <laughs> so the, uh, the the mistake that I made, just so you know, is um, the altitude angle. Let's see here. Okay. All right, so this got brought up. This is 20 degrees. Okay, never mind. It's good. I thought I made a mistake, but I didn't. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> we all work out. This confuses the hell out of me sometimes, but uh, I, I love this problem. It just always kind of gets me, you know, so but be patient, and I'll, uh, I'll have a solution here soon. <laughs> okay. What's that? Yeah, well, what we uh, made note of is just basically what you're going to do is take the solar altitude and add it to the pitch of the roof if you're talking about a, a roof mount on a pitched roof. That's correct. Yeah, because from the roof's perspective, the sun is higher in the sky, and that's all. You know, the, the altitude angle of the roof is just, uh, um, the altitude angle of the sun from the roof's perspective is just however many degrees up uh, the roof's pitch is. So um, it makes for a shorter shadow and, and uh, gives you an accurate measure. Um, so, and then the second part of this problem, you know, so now we've determined what the shadow length is at 4 p.m. But, of course, at 4 p.m., the sun is not coming in from the south. The sun is coming in from a different angle, right? So we need to determine what that angle is. And to do that, we go to that, um, um, that sun path chart for 40 degrees north. And we look down here at 4 p.m. It looks like that uh, azimuth angle at 4 p.m. is right around, we'll just say it's uh, 45, 50, 53 degrees azimuth. Okay? So, um, actually, let me capture that. Uh, 
object first. Okay. Ah. I lost it. <laughs> I'm going to have to go back and, and rebuild that. All right. Insert object. Microsoft equation. There it is. Okay, good. <laughs> Disappeared on me. Okay. So that adjacent side is 18, 18 inches. So that's our shadow length. <clears throat> New slide. Hello, Michelle. Hi. Can you hear me? I can. <laughs> We've got uh, Josh with, uh, is that American Solar? Yeah. Yep. They have a few yeah, they've got a, a, a study. I'm sorry, say that again? You're breaking up on me. That's all right. <laughs> Welcome, Michelle. Okay. So now, <clears throat> to determine the actual distance that the modules must be, rows of modules must be apart from each other, we have to do that, uh, that next part of it, which is uh, determining the perpendicular distance between the rows, when you have 18.77 inches um, uh, shadow length from the sun um, at 4 p.m., and to do that, it's a matter of using the cosine function. Okay. That up further. All right. Okay. So we know that this length here is 18.77 inches. We also know that this angle, the azimuth angle of the uh, of the sun at this time of day is 53 degrees. What we don't know is what the length of this adjacent side is, okay? So to determine the length of that adjacent side, we'll use the cosine function. The cosine function says that the cosine of the angle theta is equal to the adjacent over the hypotenuse. You have the hypotenuse, you have the angle theta, but we need to know what the adjacent is. So I'm going to go ahead and shorten this here, give myself some space. All right, so insert object. Cosine, the angle, theta is equal to <clears throat> Adjacent over the hypotenuse. Okay, which means cosine of 53 degrees is equal to the adjacent over 18.77 inches means 53 cosine 0 .6018, 0 .6018 is equal to 
be adjacent over 18.77 inches, which means 18.77 times 0 0.6018 is equal to the adjacent, which means the adjacent is equal to 0 0.6018 times 18.77. Eleven point two nine inches. So there we have it. <laughs> there it is. Where'd it go? Where's my object? Insert object. Come on now. Ah, okay. It just disappears on me. What the? Are you seeing this? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> All right, looks like we have another participant in. Oh, H, and they don't have audio yet, so uh, we won't have, we won't introduce them just yet. Um, Okay. Michelle, can you still hear everything okay? I can. Okay, good. I wasn't sure. I had a little exclamation point next to your name, and uh, I just wanted to uh, make sure everything was okay with your audio. No, All right, really. so... I got, um, I got low signal. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> anyway, so uh, just so you guys know, my thought was, I plan to build these uh, slide sets explaining these problems, and I thought, what the heck, if there's anybody out there who wants to, you know, listen in while I went through the process of explaining the problems, um, you know, why not invite everybody in if they, if they had any specific questions or if it wasn't clear. Um, and what I'm finding is it's, uh, uh, it, it's going to be a slow process because it's hard to build PowerPoint slides and communicate clearly and effectively at the same time. Um, so, but uh, I will continue. <laughs> just, uh, just note that disclaimer uh, and, and apology if it's uh, if it's too slow and, and, and abrupt. And, uh, and I'm going to go back and clean up these slides and make them a little bit more uh, easily understood, and then post them as a uh, slide share uh, for your review later. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so uh, the next thing I planned on doing was picking up, oh, we got another attendee, Josh Barkley, Jen. Jen needs to call in, <laughs> but she still isn't live on audio. <clears throat> okay. I'm going to jump into the resource guide, the map step. Is that Jen? Is that Jen Cooper? Or is that Sol? Hello, this is Sol. Uh, Hi, Sol. How you doing? This is Richard. Oh, hi, Richard. We're just um, very informally going through some of these uh, maps up questions and solutions.
Are you uh, taking the test uh, next? Yes, uh, I am. Yes, I am. I'm based in Atlanta. Uh, okay, And I will be taking Great. the North Carolina. Uh-huh. Excellent. Good luck. We'll try to help you as Thank much you. as we can. Appreciate it. Just trying to find my NAPSEP resource guide on here. Okay. It's over. Pull that one up as well as Added it already. That's why. Okay. We'll grab this next one. <clears throat> Take me a moment to transition to the next question. All right, so you guys are all familiar with this one, I believe. If you've gone through this, family of four is purchasing a 5KW net metered utility interactive PV system for their house, which is located at 30 degrees north latitude. The family members are out of the home regularly during the following hours, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. for the father, 8.30 a.m. to 12 p.m. for the mother, 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. children. While the home is unoccupied, the energy use goes to zero. There are no shade issues at the property. Uh, competing installation costs are equal. Um, and the year-round utility rate remains constant. Which of the following orientations will provide the most annual utility savings? True South, True Southeast, True Southwest, or Magnetic South? And I know everybody has the answer already because it comes with the guide. <laughs> but... Uh, um, this is uh, the kind of question you might see on the NAPSEP test. In fact, we know it is because this is a, a, a retired NAPSEP question, right? Um, in fact, uh, uh, when the concept of the new resource guide was, was, was brought up, uh, I had thought that we would get uh, uh, 60, 70, 80 of these retired NAPSEP test questions. And I was I was pretty disappointed when um, they released 
uh, 10, which I think is now reduced to 9 because one of the questions was, was flawed. Um, so this is what they're willing to give us. Um, but uh, know that this is the kind of question they would, they would, they would ask you. There's, there's a lot of information in this, in this question, and most of it is just a big, fat head fake, you know, uh, telling you about the time of day that uh, the, uh, the family members are going to be uh, in the house uh, would only be um, uh, relevant if uh, there was some kind of uh, time of use pricing structure for the utility which there is not. So that information is irrelevant. Uh, and whether or not the, uh, the home is unoccupied um, uh, uh, and the energy use goes, goes to near zero, again, that's a, that's a time of use uh, 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 question. And because there's net metering in place for this home, um, uh, uh, it, that, that doesn't matter either. So. Um, so the answer to the question is, is, uh, is true south um, because there's no compelling reason to try to optimize the uh, production um, uh, during specific times of day uh, because there's no indication that the utility price changes during the day or, you know, at, at a particular time of year. So, so all you need to know is that true south, as a rule of thumb, is, is the optimal orientation uh, to produce the maximum number of kilowatt hours um, over the course of the day, over the course of the year. Um, now, you guys also probably know that uh, um, this isn't really true. <laughs> it's true, true as a rule of thumb, but there are um, weather patterns and weather considerations that may actually drive the sweet spot, the actual optimal maximum number of kilowatt hours per year to something other than true south, okay? For instance, you know, um, I, I believe it's uh, uh, Hawaii who, uh, is, is it Hawaii where they have rain every morning, Kathy? They have the rain in the afternoon. They have the rain in the afternoon. Like New England, they always have uh, rain yeah. in the morning. Like so, <laughs> right, right. So if you're, if you're living in an area that is predominantly cloudy at a certain time of day, like in, in New England in the morning, it's always, you know, foggy and cloudy, um, then uh, you may want to optimize. You would get more kilowatt hour production by, by targeting a, uh, a more southwest orientation, okay? But uh, none of those considerations were brought up in this question, so uh, true south is, is, uh, is the way to go for something like this. Does everybody get that? Anybody have any questions or comments they want to add to that? I, I'd like I'd like that. Okay. Kathy has something that she'd like to say. <laughs> there is a, there is a table. Table. <laughs> If anybody has the Jim Dunlop book handy on page 68, there is a table that is a very interesting table. At first, I didn't understand it, but on closer scrutiny, um, it, it, it explains uh, three different cities that, um, and on the top of it, actually, um, you have the gym start up. Can you uh, access chapter three? Oh, uh, like the, the, the slide set? The PowerPoint? The yeah. uh, right. so anyway, I don't know if I have the Look at the, if you have the book, open to page 68, it says the rate orientation is set. And it's got across the top of the chart, it has various tilt angles latitude minus 20, latitude minus 10, latitude latitude plus 10 and latitude plus 20. Then on the left hand side it says Chicago, Phoenix, and Tampa. And then the azimuth angle is either 0, plus or minus 45, or plus or minus 90, meaning 0 would be facing true south, um, plus or minus 45 would be southeast or southwest, and plus or minus 90 would be facing due east or due west. And what's interesting about this chart is that if you look at Chicago, for example, um, at a true south orientation, tilted up attitudes, you get about 99% of the production, um, against, which is good. That's what you want, is 99%. As you get towards uh, latitude plus 10 or plus 20, obviously because you're uh, 
of uh, making the module steeper. You're going to be a little bit less than optimal, so you get to 0 0.96, 0 0.91, or 91 percent. When you get a little bit flatter, where it's minus 10 or minus 20, you don't seem to lose as much. You lose 10, you lose nothing at minus 10. You lose nothing, only 2 percent, 98 percent at minus 20. So we always say, you know, true south path latitude is best. What does this tell you? As you go southeast or southwest, again, a slightly steeper orientation, you lose a little bit. Um, as you get towards, uh, you know, plus or minus um, 90, meaning due east or due west, look at the difference there. And a plus 20, which would favor a winter time situation, um, you, on, on a yearly average, you only get 57% of what you would have had if you had it tilted at latitude. Whereas making it flatter, you lose a little bit. You actually get better production than if you had it at latitude if you're facing east or west. And so what this tells me is that the weather in the winter is considerably more cloudy on a daily basis than it is in the summer. Because when I make my modules steeper, which would favor a winter production, I, I lose a lot because that really doesn't favor my summertime conditions. When I make them a little bit flatter, latitude minus 10 or minus 20, um, because they get good lots of sunny days in the summer, it, uh, it doesn't lose that much. So. When Richard's talking about weather patterns, this chart is really interesting in what it shows. Now compare that with the next grouping in Phoenix, where it's almost sunny every single day. So if you look at tilt angle of latitude, azimuth of zero, true south, 100%. That's what you'd expect. And as you get either plus or minus that latitude tilt, you get a little bit of loss, but it's equal each way. You know, and same with going down um, to east or to west. And so all I'm saying is that this chart tells a lot about favoring the winter, making them steeper, or favoring the summer, making them a little bit flatter, and what that costs you depending on the tilt angle. And just studying this kind of gives you some guidance into how weather patterns can actually uh, be maximized depending on where you are and what the rain patterns are with the afternoon, with the summer versus winter, number of cloudy days are and such. So at first this chart was confusing, but then um, uh, I, so when you look at it, it's actually very interesting. So I just wanted to add that. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next question. We'll capture it from here. <clears throat> Number two. <clears throat> Let me try that one more time. Okay, next question. A PV array for a utility interactive system is to be ground mounted on a hill 1,000 feet from the point of utility connection. A single string of PV modules operates between 300 and 550 volts DC. The inverter is 240 volt inverter. There is a small building halfway between the array location and the utility point of connection. To minimize wire size, increase performance, and ensure consistent operation, where should the inverter be installed? Okay, and the choices are at the PV array, at the midpoint building, or at the utility point of connection. Okay, or midway between the PV array and the building. And uh, let me try to pull up my. 
All right. So one of the things to key in on is this. Uh, oops, hold on. This 240 volt inverter. Okay. That's the voltage of the inverter. And then the other thing to turn it tune into is the 300 to 550 volts DC. Okay. So um, if we are wanting to minimize the wire size, okay, um, which voltage would you choose? <laughs> And uh, uh, clearly, if we're trying to uh, uh, transfer power, um, uh, the, the higher the voltage, um, the, the, the lower the current at the same level of power, the lower the current, the smaller the conductor size can be. Okay? So if we're trying to minimize wire size, given the same level of power, we want the voltage to be as high as it can be. And uh, between the two options here, the 240 volt and the, uh, the 300 to 550 volt, um, uh, we can carry more power at higher voltage on the DC side uh, with, with smaller conductors than we can with, uh, uh, on the AC side at 240 volts. So, so for that reason, we would want the, uh, the DC run to be as long as it can be all the way up to uh, uh, the utility point of connection, okay? Now, another consideration is um, the voltage drop or uh, uh, more, I guess, appropriately labeled voltage rise, okay? So if you have a really long uh, conductor length, um, uh, 1,000 feet between uh, the utility interconnection uh, assuming we put the inverter at the PV array, okay, um, there's a voltage drop that can occur between the inverter and the utility, okay. The inverter is, is matching the voltage that it sees from the utility, okay. But if the voltage from the utility at the utility point of interconnection is 240 and uh, the inverter has to create voltage, which by the time it gets to the utility interconnection is 240, it may have to produce voltage at a, at a, at a voltage level that's higher than its specification, okay? So uh, the, any inverter has, a, a, has a, uh, uh, an AC voltage range, you know, a minimum and a maximum AC voltage within when, which it can operate. And it's conceivable that if your conductor run from your inverter to your utility point of interconnection is, is so long that there's voltage drop that it occurs from the inverter to, to the utility, that the voltage that the inverter has to produce to match that utility voltage actually ends up being higher than the, the range of voltage that the inverter can support. So it can actually cause the inverter to think that the grid has gone out because of the voltage drop slash voltage rise effect that occurs by having the inverter too far away from the utility interconnection. The way to mitigate that, the way to correct for that, if you have to have the inverter out at the array and out at the utility interconnection, is to uh, increase your wire size to reduce your voltage drop so that your voltage produced by your inverter can more closely match the voltage that the grid is producing. So, any questions on that? Okay, <laughs> let me clear this out, <clears throat> and we'll move on to the next one. Okay. <clears throat> This one's, you hope to get a question like this on the test. <laughs> of the following site assessment tools, which are most often needed to determine optimal array placement? Okay. Um, well, we, 
know we're going to need a compass, and that's included for everyone, so that's not going to be a consideration. Um, let me change the way I'm characterizing that. So um, we, <clears throat> to determine placement of the array, we're not going to need a multimeter. That's not going to do anything for us. Um, and, and a radiance meter doesn't give us a lot of information when we're talking about uh, um, uh, array placement. Um, an inclinometer, yes. So this has that, and that has that. A digital camera is not a requirement. Uh, uh, I can never say that word. Anemometer, hey, I think I got it. <laughs> Anemometer. <laughs> Uh, we won't need that. That uh, uh, measures the level of wind. Um, a level is not a requirement, but you're definitely going to want a sun path analyzer. So clearly the answer here is D. Okay? Moving forward through these. Okay. Um, this one's all jacked up. Uh, I'm not sure what was going on here, but uh, it looks like they started with a um, infrared shading problem, um, and uh, and somehow uh, an image uh, or, or an equation from a voltage drop calculation got uh, embedded in there. Um, so I believe in the most current version of this document, this question has just been removed completely. Um, but uh, let's go ahead and take a look at it. Uh, since uh, I have all of you guys here, and it isn't that many of you, uh, it's six, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, unmute caller number seven. I don't know what your name is, but I'll unmute you if it's, if it's quiet enough. Okay, so I'm going to put the question out to you guys. Um, from what you know about effective solar design, why is the question flawed, or, or probably, how, how is this question a flawed question? Michelle, do you want to take a stab at this? <laughs> yeah. I, already, I already mentioned that. Uh, other than the voltage drop calculations being infused into this problem, <laughs> <laughs> what is flawed? They had a question very similar to this, almost identical to this, to the, uh, uh, the April 2009 version of the study guide. Um, but as a solar designer, would you ever be designing or spacing your rows of modules based on these particular parameters? How about that? Anyone? Did somebody say no? <laughs> the American Solar Guys. The American Solar Guys say no? Um, I'll tell you what, your, your audio is uh, uh, not very good right now. Um, there's a, a chat window in your WebEx. Um, could you type in why you think you wouldn't be designing for this uh, these particular set of Circumstances? <clears throat> just type it right in there. It should be, um, just click on the chat button, and then in the chat you should be able to, to write your response. And I'll, I'll read it to everybody. It's just your audio is breaking up so bad I, I can't hardly hear what you're saying. Answer coming. All right. Got it. <laughs> okay. 
I'm going to play the Jeopardy music. Coming. <laughs> hey, that's it. Okay, so um, uh, Josh and the uh, American Solar Group uh, responded, uh, indicating, no, you would never design for this because we you designed for a 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. window with uh, max shadow at the winter solstice, and uh, that is that's. That's beautiful because um, that's just it. I, I was I've always been puzzled by how uh, NAPSEP in two different versions of their study guide put out a question that's designing for shading at solar noon. Okay, so if you're designing a system uh, using the sun altitude angle at solar noon um, uh, to to indicate how close rows can be without providing providing any shading. So you're designing a system that on that day, that shortest day of the year, uh, for that one brief moment that is solar noon, there is no shading, <laughs> which means that every other second of the day for that day, there is shading. Now, as you get away from, from the winter solstice, there's a few more moments in the day when there isn't shading, but the, the fact of the matter is you've got a, a very poorly designed system that isn't going to work very well during the winter. So. Good job, Josh. Okay, so <clears throat> what is the most important consideration for mounting PV arrays on residential rooftops with regards to energy production? Well, this is another question that you would hope to get on the NAPSIP exam because um, by now you're far enough along in your uh, solar education. No. Oh, we've got a chat here from, so, okay, you're answering the question. <laughs> cool. All right. Uh, so Josh just, uh, just uh, put his answer in uh, to question number five, I presume. Um, so by now you know that uh, uh, shading is the, the, the probably the single biggest consideration for uh, uh, certainly a, a, uh, a string inverter system. Um, and even microinverter systems, you really don't want shade, but uh, the, the microinverter system or DC to DC conversion uh, uh, schemes or apparatus um, will, will help mitigate shading, but you really don't want shading in a PV system. So that's the most important consideration. Um, not so much cooling. Uh, tilt angle uh, surprisingly has has very little impact. Um, if you go into PV watts and just experiment with uh, uh, tilt angle and even azimuth angle, you'll, you'll find, especially tilt angle though, uh, uh, you'll find that uh, the difference in uh, performance is not as much as you might think. We get a lot of uh, a lot of questions about. Uh, um, in, in our courses, uh, students asking about can you manually go out and adjust the tilts of your array, um, uh, you know, four times a year to, to optimize production. And you know, there are some systems that will allow for that. But if you look at the calculations in PV watts adjusting those angles, it really isn't going to make that much difference in your overall production. It's probably going to, over the long term, put more stress on your array. Changing those tilt angles than than it would be if you just you know, uh, let it be. So, but then standoff height, you know, that really uh, has a lot to do with cooling. A and D, it's a consideration. You know, a, a flush mount PV system right up against your rooftop with no air gap in between at all can can be harmful in a couple of ways. It can transfer a lot of heat 
into your attic space and and all the money that you're saving on your electric bill by having that solar system in place, you may be paying back in uh, additional cooling uh, uh, costs uh, because you're transferring so much heat into your your uh, uh, your building envelope um, during a time uh, you know uh, when it when it's really hot. So um, it is an important consideration making sure there's some cooling and ventilation, but uh, it, it pales by comparison to shading. So. On to the next one. <clears throat> okay. Okay. <clears throat> a homeowner wants a roof-mounted solar array that produces 90% of the annual household energy, energy consumption of 6,900 kilowatt hours. The roof has a pitch of 26 degrees and is facing tree south. The array is mounted parallel to the roof, given an 80% system efficiency and the information contained in the table below. What is the array STC rating required to achieve 90% of the annual energy needs. All right, now this is a real question. <laughs> um, and uh, let's see here. I haven't looked at this one in some time. Um, so, all right, we'll, we'll start off by trying to determine how much actual annual household energy consumption we would need, okay? So we could go uh, 0.9, which is 90%, times the annual consumption of uh, uh, 6,900 kilowatt hours is equal to... Okay, 6,210 kilowatt hours. That's how much we need to produce. Excuse the uh, writing here. It's pretty bad. I'm just getting used to using my pen again. <laughs> okay, so 6,210. Let me put that in a text here. That's how much we need to produce. 6,210 kilowatt hours per year. Okay? So, <clears throat> we have a system that's 80% uh, efficient, okay? Um, we have a rooftop that has a pitch of 26 degrees. So, let's determine how The, uh, which part of this table we need to be using. Okay, so if it's 26 degrees, and we're at latitude 41.5 degrees. I bet if we went 41.53 minus 15, we would get somewhere around 26, and that's the case. So um, we've got uh, 4.1 peak sun hours. I'll go ahead and circle this over here because I can do this all on one page so I'm not jumping around. Um, excuse me. 4.8 peak sun hours. Let me go ahead and format this shape, make it a little easier to see. Right. All right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so uh, 4.8 peak sun hours per day. All right. <clears throat> and we've got a system that's 80% uh, efficient. Okay. So, and we need to produce 6,210 kilowatt hours per year. Okay. So, we can go 6,210 
divided by 4.8 divided by 365, 2.55 divided by 0 0.8, okay, 0.43, all right. Okay, so <clears throat> at 4.8 peak sun hours per day, 4.8, or rather 6,210 kilowatt hours per year, divided by 4.8 peak sun hours per day, divided by 365 days in the year is 210 divided by 4.8 divided by 365 is 3.544 AW. However, that would work if we had a system that was 100% efficient, but we know from the problem that we're something less than 100% efficient. We're at uh, 80% efficient, so if we go 3.544 kW divided by 0.8, we get 4.43 kW. Yeah, kW, which is answer B. All right. Hey, let's um, let's see here. This is a great question, and um, I think I, I, if we could get uh, if we could get more versions of this question out there uh, for your fellow MOOCers <laughs> to uh, to work on solving, it would really be great. Um, uh, Anybody out there want to volunteer to, to uh, create a question around this concept and share it with the rest of the group? In fact, uh, we can create it on the spot right now if you like. Um, let me pull up the participants. And uh, I can make any one of you the panelists and, and allow you to uh, uh, make it to where we're seeing your desktop. How about uh, Josh? You guys want to want to crank one of these out? We don't have to. We don't have to necessarily come up with the answer for it. I mean, we can work through the problem if you like. But just generating another question that's very similar to this one, something that we can share back with the group, so that people can have yet another shot at this question. Are you there? How about Michelle? Okay. I wish I could. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about this? How about I uh, modify this question? And I'll go Control C, and we'll create a, uh, a new slide that is title only. And I'll go in here, and we're going to uh, key off of this question to create a new one. Okay. Um, I'm going to do that by cropping this one up a little bit, making some space for myself, and uh, we'll just uh, steal shamelessly from the, uh, <laughs> the NACSEF uh, writers here. So we'll say a homeowner wants a roof-mounted solar array that produces 30% uh, of the annual household energy consumption of, uh, we'll say, 22,000 kilowatt hours, uh, 24,000 kilowatt hours. The roof has a pitch of 26. Oh no, we'll say the roof has a pitch. Oh, here we go. We'll 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 make it crazy. We'll we'll say the roof has a uh, 212 pitch. Aha! Hold a little trig in there. <laughs> and is facing true south. 
Um, the array is hmm. Okay. Um, let me just check one thing here because in making a question, it can be a real gotcha if you if you don't have the right uh, 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 all right, so a 2 divided by 12 pitch roof on stand shift is going to be 9.46 degrees. Okay. Pardon me? Okay, so that will be, that'll be the pitch of the roof, 9.4. Uh, I'm going to say it's uh, 10 degrees. Okay. I'm going to take away that uh, that 12 to 12 pitch. 30 degree pitch. Homeowner at 30 degrees. North latitude wants a roof mounted solar array that produces 30% of the annual household energy consumption of 22,000 kilowatt hours. The roof has a 30 degree pitch and is facing uh, true south. <clears throat> the array is mounted parallel to the roof. Given 83% system efficiency. I will just TV watch. Seventy seven percent system efficiency. And the information contained in the table below. What is the array STC rating required to achieve? 30% of the annual energy need. Okay, so um, I'll go ahead and grab the uh, Austin uh, installation, solar installation table for Austin. Okay, and we'll grab uh, let's see. I'll do this in two parts. Ooh, start letting me <laughs> capture this. So, All right, I'm going to do a new slide that has the table and all the data needed. <clears throat> and at this point, <clears throat> I think I can probably squeeze all this into one slide if I did this. Okay. All right, so we bring that out there. Okay. <clears throat> Who wants to take a stab at answering this question? <laughs> Any volunteers? I'll turn over. Um, uh, desktop control, and you can uh, uh, try to type this out on your um, on your computer. And we can come up with a solution. 
Jen? Michelle? Soul? <laughs> this is free tutoring. There's no harm in, uh, oh, I see Jen talking. Oh, was that, were you just laughing? <laughs> Okay, well, um, let's gather the piece. Oh, all right. Soul. Okay, so Soul, Soul, I'm going to make you panelist. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, capture this information real quick. Well, well you got it. Um, Soul, did you get a, a screen capture of the... Um, uh, the question? Um, I, I, think, I mean, I see the screen. I, I'm sorry. Oh, do you want me to? What, what, what should I do? Just capture it? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just made you a, uh, a panelist, so I'm going to pass. Okay. Uh, um, actually, here's a thought. I'm giving you control of my computer. Um, uh oh. <laughs> so, so that way. So, so you, you, it's up to you to accept it, um, but you can uh, either talk through the problem or um, uh, use use my slide set. You should be able to to control my mouse and, and my my presentation. You can add a new slide. You can okay, however you want to do. It. Um, okay, I, I mean I can talk through with. I, I'm on the computer right now. Um, uh, I, I can try talking through with it if you like. Sure, um, go for it. Okay, sure. Uh, I'm not sure how to actually enter data. Oh, oh I think I can. Oh, good. Yep. Okay, I'm testing there. Yeah, it's just okay. like it's your right. computer. You can create a new slideshow. You can you can do all that. Oh, okay. Very um, cool. Create a new slide. Oh, uh, you know, copy into another. Just just like I was doing. You can you have all that sure. control. Okay, let me. Just give a shot. Give that a shot right now. I'll try to be quick. Okay. And all right. So I'll, I'll leave the same slide here because all the information is there. It's easy to work with. And I'll just start entering my sure. thoughts right here. Is that okay? Perfect. Okay. However you want to do it. That looks good. Sure. Okay. Thirty percent of twenty-two kW is equal. Okay. So what I'm going to try to do is just work backwards. In this, so see what their energy requirement is per year. So I'm just going to get some figures out there. Uh, it just helps me think better, if that's all right. So 22,000 times 30 percent. So we're trying to produce 66. Oops, I'm sorry. Bear with me. Ah, okay. All right. So. 66 watt hours of energy per year. So it's 30 degree pitch. The latitude is 30 degrees. That's great. Facing true south, really great. Okay, excellent. So the tilt uh, is latitude down right here. We've got the average for uh, minimum, maximum. I guess I'll take the average which is 5.3 peak sun hours per year. Is this okay what I'm doing? The, the, you're okay with hey. me doing it this way? No, absolutely. This is fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, great. Yeah, it's, I'm not formatting anything. I'm just getting all my thoughts out there. Okay. We, yep. we have a quick mm -hmm. question here. Where are we getting 5.3 when the pitch matches the latitude? Okay. The, it looks like the average for the year is 4.9 up in the upper right-hand column. Okay, am I reading this incorrectly? Uh, that's the tilt of zero. I, I, I think we want the tilt equal to latitude, which oh, is right, right, right. the very last row. And there's the 5.3 that I got there. Are, are you guys in agreement with that? Yeah, we are at, we are at latitude. Okay. We're, we're at latitude. So. Yeah, these are not relative 
the tilt is absolute right there. Okay. Right. Okay. Great. Okay. So 5.3 times 365 is equal to, just bring up my handy dandy calculator, 5.3 times 365 is 1934.5. So that would be 1930 um, kilowatt hours per year. Sorry. Okay. So that's how much we would produce. And then 77% peak efficiency. So I multiply that by 1934.5. Equal to, okay, times 77, kind of like a performance ratio, I guess. Okay, 1489 or 1490, just round it off. Easy to work with that. Is equal to 1490 um, <clears throat> kilowatt hours books per year. So that's how much I would produce, right? Okay, let's see what's the next part. <clears throat> okay, bear with me. Okay, all right. So, that system... Oh, wait, wait, I think I... I'm sorry. I, I, I did that incorrectly. Okay. I think um, 77% efficiency. I, I'm sorry, that was wrong. I think what I meant to do is 1934 divided by 0.77, okay? <clears throat> because if the system efficiency is 77%, I have to produce that much more in order to get what I'm trying to achieve right here. Okay, so 19... 34.5 divided by 0.77 is 2515. Okay, 2512 rather. Okay. So that's what I need to achieve out of the array. Okay. So, and, okay, so that's what I need to get. Okay, what am I doing? Incorrectly now. 2512 <coughs> divided by. <coughs> help me out here a little bit, uh, Richard. Yeah, I, uh, I'll help you. Uh, uh, so, um, so I, I think you're you're mixing up the uh, uh, two of the two of the concepts. There's um, the available energy, okay, from the sun. Um, a 5.3 peak sun hours per day. That's 5.3 hours per day where the sun will be producing at standard test conditions. So you are right by taking the 5.3 times uh, 365 to get to 1,934.5 hours um, where you, you are producing at uh, um, uh, standard test conditions of 1,000. Uh, watts per per uh, per square meter. Okay, um, but in terms of um, understanding how much energy uh, uh, capacity you need, what, I, what uh, the method that I like to use <clears throat> is the um, the you need 6,600 uh, kilowatt hours per year to achieve that 30 um, percent. Uh, uh, um, of 22,000 kilowatt hours per year. So um, I would take that 6,600 uh, uh, kilowatt hours divided by 5.3 peak sun hours per day divided by 365 mm. days in the year. Um, and then you'll get uh, a, 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 a number in kilowatts that, uh, that you need to to produce that level, not taking into consideration any any D rating, that uh, standard PV watts sure. D rate of 0.77. So it's just um, um, 
you know, you, you are correct in that uh, 5.3 times 365 is 1,934, you know, um, uh, peak sun hours per year. Um, and, and eventually you can actually take that number and take the, the, the 6,600 kilowatt hours divided by 1,934.5 uh, uh, peak sun hours and, and you'll get the, the, uh, the uh, non-D-rate corrected value for the system right. size that you need. Yeah. Like this, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So had you done that step right there, then yeah. you would have been uh, on the right track. So what you get is a size in kilowatts of the system uh, uh, that, that, that you need to have, not accounting for the D-rate. You didn't then take Correct. that number divided by 0.77. <clears throat> right. So there yeah. we have it. 3.41 kilowatt peak, right? Yep. Um, and then 3.41 divided by 0.77. And that gives us, okay, divided by 0.77 is 4.43 kilowatt peak. Uh, you see. Okay. That's it. So that that's it. Okay, great. All right. It's uh over. Yeah. You know, that's that's really interesting that uh, that four point four three uh uh was the same answer from the previous question. <laughs> what a coincidence, <laughs> huh? <laughs> All right. Okay. So shall I hand it back to you? How how should I do that? Yeah, so um I think what I do is I uh Change role to hmm. Uh, change role to. I'll change you back to attendee, and then that should give me. Uh, uh, can you control my desktop anymore? Uh, yes, I still can. Huh. Interesting. Okay. So let me go back here and sign fast keyboard. The mouse control. Let me try to get that thing worked out. <laughs> All right. Move mouse to get control. So all I have to do is move the mouse. Uh, let me hit refresh here. Um, Interesting. That is really strange. Um, okay, let, let's see if I can return control. Okay. Yeah, maybe you have to like return. Choose to give it up. <laughs> I think I did, and now it's yours. Okay, great. Thank you. Hmm. Right. Nope, we still have control. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. I'm That's trying. all right. This is really strange. Okay, so um, let me get in here. Let's see. I had thought that by changing you back to an attendee, um, it would, it would uh, take away control. Like you would have to be uh, okay. So full H change rule to okay, so let me deselect. Okay, there we go. I had to go in and deselect you. Um, all right, so we'll move forward with these uh with these problems. We just finished number six. We can move on to number seven. Excuse me, number there is no number seven. <laughs> All right. I think that number seven was the one that got uh, yanked. Okay. Number eight. New slide. Add a lonely. Drop it on in there. <clears throat> the battery. Bank for a battery backup utility interactive PV system is located in a harsh environment, temperature and humidity extreme. System charge controller has provision for temperature, 
Oh. <laughs> Somebody just joined in. Um, okay. Uh, the system charge controller has provisions for temperature compensation, but it is not connected. What is the most likely result on the battery state of charge? Okay. So, thing to keep in mind that in hotter temperatures, the voltage, the charging voltage needs to be adjusted downward um, automatically through the temperature sensor um, to avoid overcharging. By the same token, under cold, colder conditions, uh, requires a higher voltage to keep the batteries charged. Um, so if there's no temperature compensation going on in either direction, then the net result is you will be undercharged in cold weather. Undercharged in cold weather and overcharged in hot weather. So the answer is D. That's just one of those things that you'll have to commit to memory. Um, I don't know that NAPSEP necessarily needs you to understand the science behind it all. Um, I would just uh, uh, let that reside in your mind as just uh, rote memorization. You need more voltage to charge a battery in the cold and less voltage to charge a battery in the hot. Therefore, without any compensation, you're going to undercharge in cold weather and overcharge in hot weather. Okay? Move it up. <clears throat> okay. What is the required minimum working space width in front of a 48 volt lead acid battery bank? All right. Um, and this is where um, I really like the Mike Holt book uh, for uh, this, this part of the code, which I believe is 110.26, which uh, has the, uh, the, the spatial relationship requirements, the minimums and maximums uh, for uh, installed equipment. Um, let me see if I can't pull up that, uh, that reference and share that with you in the code. So. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure everybody knows that uh, on the uh, Soul Power People website, we've got a free copy, electronic copy of the National Electric Code. Um, I believe we posted it in the first or second or maybe the third newsletter, a link. Um, it's free to everyone. It comes from the, uh, this particular version comes from the state of Oregon. Um, I guess the, 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 the rationale for being able to provide it for free is <clears throat> that uh, um, because the National Electric Code is uh, a requirement, it's basically a rule of law um, uh, in, 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 in many regards, uh, that it must be readily available for the citizens. Um, uh, so, therefore, it is not in violation of copyright to post a free electronic version of it, and uh, there are several state, states that do this. Uh, but as far as the 2011 NEC, so far, the uh, state of Oregon is the only one that I've seen posting that one, um, but there's multiple states that have the 2008 version. So, this is it. Let me try to get to section. It's actually searchable, so um, it should be. So 110.26, okay, all right, jump to the next page, spaces about electrical equipment, let me try to find, I'm not the code master that Mike Holt is, he, uh, if you saw his video, he was uh, all over the place. Um, <clears throat> Okay, and the question is, what is the required minimum workspace width in front of a 48 volt lead acid battery bank? Okay, so, the depth 
of working spaces. So we're not concerned about the depth so much. Uh, we're concerned about the width. Okay, and then here's here's the answer. I'll I'll, I'll uh, show you that it's uh, one ten dot twenty six a two. Okay, so we're looking at this guy right here, width of working spaces. The width of the working space in front of the electrical equipment shall be the width of the equipment, 30 inches, or 30 inches, whichever is greater. In all cases, the workspace shall permit at least a 90-degree opening of equipment doors or hinge panels. Um, so based on that, we know that the answer is D. But uh, if, if you don't have a copy of it, the whole Illustrator Guide, the NEC, uh, has uh, a great illustration of all of these relationships. So, the work space, a depth, it's high, clear spaces, minimal requirement, large equipment, they have these really, really well thought out diagrams to help all these words to be uh, a place to go, visual representation. Two indications that the audio is breaking up. Is it still breaking up? You're good. You're good now, Richard. Okay. All right. Well, I'll, I'll continue. Okay. All right. So, um, so this inverter can handle strings of nine or ten. Okay. Um, answer A. 15 modules on one roof and five modules on the other roof, which implies that one of those strings is getting broken up um, in a different plane. Um, and uh, what we know about a string of modules is that the current in the string is the current of the lowest performing module in the string. It's all created by that lowest performing module, which incidentally, is gated by the lowest performing cell within the module. And if it is a function of a radiant, and you have two different modules or two different parts of the same string in a different plane, then you're getting two different levels of a radiance, which means you're getting two different currents. Anyway, one, whichever side is producing the lowest current, the biggest current for the entire so, so therefore, you do not 
ever want to have two uh, modules on the same string in, in, in different planes. You always want to make sure that the modules from the same string are in the same plane. Okay? So question A implies that 15 modules, you have broken up that string, which means that you're going to have a severe performance penalty by having cut that string, string in half and put those modules in a different plane. Question B, or answer B rather, uh, 12 modules on the southwest group and 8 modules on the southeast group, again implies that some number of those 12 modules uh, on the southwest group are coming from the uh, 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 string on the, uh, oh, wait a second, 10 and 10, yes, right, so uh, it means that there's 10 modules from one string on the southwest group and two modules from the other string on the southwest group, which means you've got that, that, that uh, uh, string broken up into two, uh, which is going to be cause a severe penalty, okay? Uh, number C, uh, 10 modules on the southwest group and five modules on the southeast group. I don't even know how the system works, because in, in that case, you've got uh, um, uh, you don't enough modules to produce two strings, um, even if they're broken up, you're not getting the voltage that you need. So again, it's a, it's a flawed uh, uh, solution. So the only thing that makes sense in this case is to have 10 modules on the southwest group and zero modules on the southeast group. Okay? Um, now, one of the things we preach in solar is always make sure you've got the same orientation no matter what, you know, uh, same azimuth, same pitch uh, throughout the array. The fact of the matter is um, uh, you can have strings in different orientation um, as long as you don't have parts of the same string in different orientation. And that is to say you can have a, a, a string of modules in parallel with another string of modules uh, uh, tied into an inverter, and those two strings don't necessarily have to be in the same plane. You're going to get a little bit of a penalty. It's going to be, uh, I believe, that the, the rule of thumb is you, you might lose 3 to 5 percent of the, the production that you otherwise would have gotten, but you can do it. The key is you can't break up modules from the same string and put them in different planes, but you can have two strings in parallel that are in different planes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Any questions? We've gotten through the uh, <clears throat> the, the ten or I guess uh, nine actual questions from the, the resource guide. Um, maybe the thing we should do now is uh, walk through. <laughs> okay. Ah, case study. Okay. So, what can we do with this? Seem like a good study activity? Dissect the case study that's been provided for us? All I need is one person to guess. How about yeah, IPS? Let's see, what do we get from uh, Josh? Ah. <laughs> Go with power, power one inverters when you have that problem. Yes, absolutely. Power one, the Aurora Power one is an amazing, an amazing, an amazing product. Um, the Power one has uh, two uh, uh, MPPT inputs, two maximum power point tracking inputs, which uh, uh, basically means you can have two different modules and different 
uh, voltage type, two strings rather, that are made up of two different module types. It could be a different orientation, doesn't matter from, from the power one's perspective, they're two different systems, but they're going to be able to process power for both of them. Okay? In addition to that, power one has this crazy voltage range. I, I don't know how they do it. They've got a transformerless inverter, um, but they are um, able to uh, uh, operate in a voltage range as low as, yeah, I want to say 90, 90 volts. Requires going in and doing some manual uh, changes to their, to their start voltage. Uh, but uh, I believe it's a low of 90 volts and a high of like, yeah, I don't know, it's like 550. It's like crazy high. So it's um, great flexibility. In the same way that uh, the benefits of a microinverter allows you to have different modules in the system, Power One Aurora gives you that flexibility too. Um, and, uh, and, and furthermore, because it's got such a, a broad uh, range, you can add, and, and two MPPCP, MPPC inputs, you can start a system, an Aurora system, with as few as five 60 cell modules in series, okay? And that's five 220 you know, watt modules in series, 1.2 kW, and then expand it over time up to as much as, uh, you know, I think uh, 3,500 watts to 3,750. It's got a 3,000 watt uh, um, AC output. Uh, so the, the power going in, I believe, is a maximum recommended at 3,750. So it has all or many of the advantages of, of a microinverter system, but it's done in a centralized inverter way. So, anyway. All right, I still haven't gotten a yes on the, uh, uh, I'm going through the, his, uh, his problems here, or the, or the case study that's been provided in the resource guide. Again, that yes. Type it in. Say yes if you want to go over. Yes. yes. Got, got a yes. Okay, so let's uh, let's try to dissect these suckers, shall we? All right. So in example one, we're given a grid tied string inverter PV system connected to the load side of the service panel. Here are the module ratings, 230 watt, 7.79 uh, maximum power current, 29.5 uh, uh, voltage, 37.3 uh, open circuit voltage, 8.41 um, ISC, short circuit current, uh, maximum series fuse, uh, so the maximum overcurrent protection for the string is 15 amps. Um, although you would likely have something less than that. Um, uh, maximum power is 230 watts, system voltage 200. The VOC temperature coefficient is given as a percentage um, as opposed to an absolute value. And uh, you need to understand that distinction. Uh, when it's given as a percentage, you can either um, keep it as a percentage and do your calculations the way Jim Dunlop did as he described this case study, or uh, you can do what I like to do and convert it to an absolute value of millivolts per degree Celsius uh, change. Um, either way is valid. Um, it, it doesn't really matter. So we've got uh, this make-believe inverter. It has a maximum DC voltage rating of 600 volts and has a maximum power at 40 degrees Celsius. And that 40 degrees Celsius is the CEC uh, 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 temperature um, that uh, California Energy Commission on their Go Solar California website, they've got a listing of the power output at this normalized value of 40 degrees Celsius. So um, a lot of uh, uh, rebates from the utilities require that you use the 40 degrees Celsius and, and um, uh, CEC uh, weighted efficiency values come from, from these measures. So uh, nominal AC voltage of 240 volts, <clears throat> maximum AC current of 32 amps, maximum overcurrent protection device rating of uh, uh, 50 amps.
that uh, they can be talking, but they have a question or okay. Is that you, Jen? Uh, no. Okay. All right. Okay. So, moving forward. There's a time question to consider. All right. Um, what does the input considered maximum voltage of this module at this location? So I'm going to capture this, uh, capture this value. And uh, we'll come back to our PowerPoint presentation. Mm -hmm. We'll create a new slide, and we'll type it in here. Okay. So um, <clears throat> this is the method that uh, um, Mike Holt, or not Mike Holt, but uh, Jim Dunlop has given. Um, I'm going to show you uh, another one. Um, and uh, let me just uh, get this going. Okay, so we know that there's a point point three seven percent per degree um, Celsius uh, temperature change. Okay, and that value is against the VOC of the module. Okay, um, so we multiply point zero seven three percent times the VOC of the module, and we get the per degree Celsius temperature, or uh, Celsius, uh, what's your, just that, right? Voltage change. I'm sorry, Dr. T. What's that? Is there anything um, in there? Isn't it by the, uh, the change in temperature? Uh, yes, this, this, this applies to, this is the voltage change in response to temperature, okay? So, um, for this particular module, for every degree Celsius that it changes, it's actually a negative relationship, it's, uh, it's uh, stated as, as this, negative 0.37% per degree Celsius um, uh, times the VOC, okay? which means that, uh, that for every degree Celsius voltage uh, increase, um, uh, or well, we'll say decrease, decrease, the voltage goes down by that amount. Okay? So the thing to remember, and this is the, uh, what people, when they're doing the calculations, they get messed up on is 0. 0.37% means that you're multiplying 0 0.0037 times the VOC. And the VOC of this particular module is 37.3, if, if I recall correctly. Yep. The v open circuit voltage under standard test conditions, 37.3 volts. Thirty-seven point three volts is equal to some number. All right. So when we go into the you know, calculator, go to the calculator. All right. Here we go. Point zero zero three seven times three seven point three we get 0.138, so our absolute value of voltage change for this particular um, device is 0 0.1380. So we're losing uh, uh, 0 0.138 um, volts per degree Celsius, okay? Then, if we want to determine how much voltage increase we'll get, that's a matter of multiplying the number of degrees Celsius away from standard test conditions we are, okay? 
So the way I like to look at that is if you go back here, where we're given the guidance, okay, the lowest expected ambient temperature based on the ASHRAE, which is the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, minimum mean extreme dry temperature for ASHRAE location, most similar to the installation is negative 15. All right? So how far away, so ask yourself the question, how far away from STC is negative 15, okay? And if, I always try to think of it in terms of like a, uh, uh, I draw a line, okay? I think this is what I see in my mind with this picture, okay? Um, so we've got a point here that is zero, okay? Zero degrees Celsius, all right? So we've got this other point that is uh, positive 25 degrees Celsius, okay? Now we've got this other point down here that is negative 15 degrees Celsius. So the question is, how far is negative 15 from positive 25? And the answer is, it's negative 40 degrees Celsius, okay? 25, it's 40 degrees in the negative direction from, from 25 degrees Celsius. So, so if we multiply, 40, negative 40 degrees Celsius times the negative 0.138 volts, we get some number that is the absolute uh, uh, times 40. The two negatives multiplied together is positive, right? Negative 40 times negative 0.138. So it becomes 5.520, 5 5.52, okay, volts. That is the voltage change per module that you should expect on the coldest day, all right? But to determine the maximum voltage per module, per module it's just a matter of taking 37.3, that open circuit voltage, and adding the 5.52, which is equal to... Five point five two plus thirty seven point three forty seven point eight two forty seven forty two excuse me forty two point eight two which is the same answer that was given by uh Mr. Dunlop over here when he went through his process for answering it. It's up to you to decide which is easier. Uh for me it, it helps me process things more clearly when I break it down into the absolute uh voltage per degree Celsius, and then just work with that number. But either method will get you to the same 42.8 volts, 42.82 volts. It's the same thing. Okay. So, any questions on that? Yeah, could you put that slide think, back up one more time? We're just writing down your method as uh, compared to the one that was given in the uh, example. Yeah. Yep, I can leave it on there for a second. For about two minutes, maybe a minute. Uh huh. And it's just personal preference. I mean, he just takes that percentage and uh, applies it to uh, the uh, uh, straight against the uh, uh, the the degree temperature change. Okay, of forty. Um, and he basically adds 14.8 percent. He takes the 0 .0037 times the negative 40 degrees, and he gets 0.148. It gets added back to the uh, 100 percent value, which was uh, 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 the one there, the 1.148. 
see, for me, I look at that and I, I'm like, well, what's the one for? <laughs> Why is that there? You know, Jim Dunlop is an engineer and he thinks like an engineer. Um, but the fact of the matter is, uh, uh, a lot of people in the solar industry are, are, are not engineers, and I'm not an engineer, but so I have to um, translate things into ways that make sense to me. Um, and if, you, if you've got, uh, you know, a mindset that allows you to take those pure engineering um, formulas and take them, process them, understand them, uh, then, then, then go with that. But if you need another way to think about things, um, you know, I suggest you do it. There. <laughs> okay, so I got to uh, Can you put that slide back up? All right. So um, I'm, I'm just, I just keep adding information to slides, like, like the same slide set. So um, it, at the end of the, uh, uh, the study session, anybody who wants just this raw slide set, just all these notes that I'm taking, um, I'll, I'll be happy to, to send it to you as it is. And since you're participating in the in this you know event, you'll understand. You'll be able to put everything in context, um, so you won't, you don't have to you know capture every note. Yes, he said he'll send it. He'll email it to us. We just yeah. got to let him know. Okay, we're we're good to go on that slide. Thanks. We'll uh we'll probably ask him. we'll get you to email him to us. Sure. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So let me. Do another one. We'll move on and see what else Mike or Jim rather has in store for us. All right. This one's easy. <clears throat> because we uh, came up with the same value for maximum voltage per module, it's a, uh, you know, his answer is my answer. And you would just take the maximum voltage divided by. 42.8 is equal to 14.02, but you have to round down because if you round up, then it's going to push you over that 600 volt maximum. Um, now, I will say that um, while it's a good idea to crank your voltage up as much as possible in PV design, um, you may find that in doing so, maximizing the voltage per string. It, it does a lot to keep you away from that minimum voltage, so you're not ever in, in you know, uh, having to worry about an inverter turning off due to low voltage and hot conditions. Um, but what, what you may end up sacrificing in, in applying a maximum voltage, maximum number of modules strategy is uh, 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 balancing your design in the sense that uh, um, uh, you may only be able to put a certain number of strings to an inverter. Uh, case in point would be the, the Sunny Boy 3000 um, when designed with, um, uh, I believe it's uh, Solar World 175 watt modules. Okay, you can work through the calculations for Austin, Texas, and determine that you can get 10 modules per string. Okay, um, but in putting 10 modules per string together. Uh, uh, and not exceeding the maximum DC recommended input, you're only adding um, about, uh, oh, what is it? 10 modules per string, 1,750. Uh, I, I said 175-watt modules. It's 150-watt uh, modules, okay? So um, in using 150-watt modules, set of them in, in, in series string, you get 1.5 kW per string. Uh, you're getting 3,000 watts DC that you're putting to a 3,000 watt AC inverter, which means that you're leaving a lot of power on the table um, because that inverter can actually handle 3,750 watts DC input, um, uh, which it almost needs all of that to have 3,000 watts of AC output. So by designing your system such that it um, uh, maximizes the voltage 
you may be minimizing your power because if you go through the uh, um, uh, calculations in a different way, you'll see that if you just limit your number of modules in series to eight, that you can actually get three strings of eight at um, uh, uh, something less than, I can't remember what it was, oh yeah, 1.2 kW per string, so you've got 3.6 kW DC input going to an inverter that's the output of 3 kW AC, you're not exceeding the maximum DC recommendation, you're, giving, you're feeding your inverter enough, enough power and you're still keeping your voltage high enough so that it doesn't go off on those hot days. So the moral of the story is don't always design for maximum voltage in the string um, at the ex of uh, DC power um, uh, uh, um, being utilized by the inverter. There can be a trade-off there, okay? All right, so moving on to the next part of the question. <clears throat> And I'll just slap this one in here. It's the same. Uh, no change there. What is the maximum system voltage as it's defined by 690.7? Okay. And the number of modules in series times the maximum voltage that we calculated for, 42.8 volts. Um, since they referenced this um, uh, code specifically, I'm going to pull it up and show it to you because there's a couple of things that you need to know <clears throat> I'd like to point out about article 690 and table 690, excuse me, article, article 690.7 and table 690.7. And uh, it takes a while to search the document to get up to the right place. Okay. <clears throat> So, <clears throat> we'll just read through this quickly because this is something you need to know. Maximum photovoltaic system voltage in a DC PV source, source circuit or output circuit, the maximum PV system voltage for that circuit shall be calculated as a sum of the rated open circuit voltage of the series connected volt PV modules corrected for the lowest expected ambient temperature. Okay, so that part of the code has been there for a while, many, many years, but uh, without any reference to what the lowest expected ambient temperature, or rather, what is the source of the lowest expected ambient temperature, okay? Um, and in absence of any guidance uh, uh, from the AEC, the TV industry on its own decided that the lowest expected ambient temperature is actually what they would use record low, which is an extremely conservative estimate of, of uh, 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 or extremely conservative uh, way of uh, applying this rule um, because uh, typically during those record low situations uh, where you're getting the absolute lowest, there's no irradiance at all because it happens at night. <laughs> so in that, in that sense, it's, uh, it's, it's overkill to use the, the, the record low. Uh, but yet, for years, the industry utilized that, and some authorities having jurisdiction still require that you use that, okay? However, for 2011, there's an informational note, which used to be called a fine print note, now they're called informational note. Uh, down below, it says, where one source for statistically valid lowest expected ambient design data for various locations is the um, uh, ASHRAE handbook. Okay, um, and these temperature data can be used to calculate maximum voltage using the manufacturer's temperature coefficients relative to the rating temperature of 25 degrees Celsius, which is standard test conditions. Okay, so um, so here it is. We've got the NEC pointing us in the direction to get uh, 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 this information, and it's, uh, it's 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 really helpful because it provides a lot more flexibility. Consider this the um, the record low um, in Austin, Texas, was negative two degrees Fahrenheit, okay? Um, and the ASHRAE low for Austin, Texas, I believe is 17 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's 17 degrees Fahrenheit difference that um, the NEC will uh, allow for if you were to utilize the, the ASHRAE average expected low ambient temperature um, versus, versus the record low. 
So, um, uh, and for these problems, they're, they're having us use the ASHRAE as well. Uh, so, okay, the other consideration is that for crystalline and multi-crystalline silicon modules, the rated open circuit voltage shall be multiplied from the correction factor provided in table 690.7, okay? It says, this voltage shall be used to determine the voltage ratings of cables, disconnects, over current devices, and other equipment. It says, where the lowest expected ambient temperature is below 40 degrees Celsius, or where other than crystalline or multi-crystalline silicon piece modules are used, the system voltage adjustment shall be made in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions. Okay? So this table, 690.7, is only good for multi-crystalline uh, or, or monocrystalline modules. Any other technology, you're required to use the manufacturer's instructions. But the next sentence, and this is what I wanted to point out to everybody, it says, when open circuit voltage temperature coefficients are supplied in the instructions for listed PV modules, they shall be used to calculate the maximum PV system voltage. So there isn't, I, I can't think of, a module produced today that doesn't have a specification that includes the VOC temperature uh, uh, coefficient uh, and, and the requirement to use it. So. Um, this table, 690.7, really only exists for test-taking, you know, situations. Unless you're dealing with a bunch of old modules, which maybe you're repurposing or you're qualifying the design or, or refurbishing the system or whatever, you would never be using table 690.7. You would always be using the VOC temperature coefficient provided by the manufacturer. But... Uh, uh, <laughs> in the test, you will likely be referred to this table. So, anyway, I just wanted to point that out. <clears throat> so, the number of modules in series, we've got 14 of them. 14 times 42.8 is 599.2 volts, which is right on the edge of maximum. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Let's uh, take a look at the next part of this. So, if the mod module degradation is 0.5% per year, okay, uh, minimum voltage of the inverter is 300 volts DC, and the mod CMP is 0.5%, that 5% shows up as a rule of thumb in so many ways. Uh, what is the minimum number of modules in series that will keep the VMP above 300 volts DC in 20 years from now if the module's operating at a temperature of 65 degrees Celsius, okay? So they not only want you to know if the system's going to work now, they want you to apply a factor to determine whether it's going to be functional in 20 years. So what's the minimum number of modules that you can have in the series and have it still work in 20 years, okay? So um, let's see. 20 years voltage loss. I actually, uh, I like the way, well, let's see. We need to stay above 300 volts DC. Okay. Yeah. So, <clears throat> all right. So, basically, we'll look at this on a, on a module level basis. I see a lot of numbers in here, but maybe I'll try to um, uh, break it out the way I would do it and see if that makes it different for you. Maybe exactly the same, I don't know. All right, so 20 years times uh, point zero zero five is equal to point one. Okay, this point five percent is point zero zero five. Let me just pull up the calculator so you guys can see this. 0 0.005 times E is 0 0.1, okay? So according to this, right off the bat, uh, over a course of 20 years, you're going to lose 10% of, um, of your voltage, all right? Now, I want to point out that this may not be entirely accurate, okay? Uh, 
most module specifications indicate that, that uh, uh, or at least from what I've heard, um, I, that if you lose 0.5% um, uh, of power per year, okay, and how much of that power loss is due to voltage, there hasn't really been um, a, a lot of data generated about that. And in the um, absence of that data, uh, um, I believe in uh, Bill Brooks' um, article, Array Voltage Considerations, which I definitely recommend you all read. It's a, I believe it's a solar pro article, um, Array Voltage Calculations. It was in the last year or two. Uh, he goes into a lot of detail on this. Um, it's on the reading list. <laughs> the the Kathy's putting forth to you. October, uh, November uh, 2010. Yeah, it's the October, November 2010 issue of Solar Pro Magazine. <clears throat> and it'll be going out as part of your reading for this next section of the MOOC. Um, but in it, he indicates that, you know, I, I believe he says that you lose 0.5% uh, uh, per year due to power loss uh, um, and that without any data to indicate how much of that loss is from voltage versus how much is from current, um, that I think he split it in half where, you know, you're losing 0.25% um, uh, 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 per year uh, of voltage contribution. Um, but if you look at the article online, uh, somebody posts a comment that indicates that there actually has been some data around this topic and, uh, uh, and that uh, from, from at least one study, the greatest contributed, contributed to power loss of time is not from voltage loss, but rather from current loss. And this makes sense when you consider that uh, a large part of the, 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 the degradation is likely due to uh, the, the ability of light to penetrate the glass, the module, due to pitting or soiling or, you know, some abrasion on the glass itself that keeps light from coming in. The radiance is related to current, so therefore current is what's lost if you're having trouble with your glass. So um, at any rate, read that article, check it out, and uh, I, I think you'll be surprised to see how um, liberal <laughs> uh, Bill is on the high voltage side but how extremely conservative he is on the low voltage side. As, as a, uh, we may think that we're taking, you know, extra precautions by adding this 20 years at 0.5% uh, uh, when calculating the minimum number of modules, but uh, uh, Bill has found a way to add about two or three or four more other considerations into that uh, calculation that drives the number of modules up. To him, it seems, the cardinal sin of solar PV design is allowing your system to turn off on a sunny day due to heat. <laughs> anyway, okay, so moving on. So we're losing 0.1%. So right off the bat, under, under these assumptions, we've got 0.9 times whatever our um, uh, VMP, VMP uh, of the module was, okay? And the VMP was, uh, we'll go back to and the VMP, the maximum power voltage of 29.5, okay? So 0.9 times 29.5 volts is equal to 0.9 times 29.5 is equal to 26.55, okay? 26.55 volts, all right? And... Um, so just so you understand, uh, we're going to lose 10%, which means that 90% is still left behind. So the reason behind the 0 0.9 times times uh, 29, uh, the 0.9 number here is the fact that 90% is still left on the table. So that means that 26.55 volts is still available after that degradation. Okay. And the next consideration is temperature. All right. So we're saying that uh, 65 degrees Celsius, okay, um, 65 degrees Celsius is uh, how far away is 65 degrees from standard test conditions? I'm going to write that down there. How far away is 65 degrees Celsius 
from STB, STC, okay? All right, and the answer is 65 minus 25. It's the uh, um, answer, 40. 40 degrees, positive 40 degrees, okay? All right, so we take that um, 40 degrees Celsius, positive 40 degrees Celsius, and we multiply it by negative, because temperature coefficients are always a uh, negative relationship. It's an inverse relationship between uh, temperature and voltage, so it's negative 0 0.005 again is equal to, um, what is that? Let me just type it out. So, point, point zero zero five times 40 is 0.2. Okay. So, on this day, when it's 20 degrees Celsius, um, we're going to lose 20%. Okay? Which means we're going to leave behind 80%. Which means we need to take 0.8 times this uh, 26.55 volts, which is the uh, degradation over time, and we get uh, 0.8 times 26.55 is 21.24, okay? 21.24 volts. <clears throat> so that's the VNP that we should expect 20 years from now when it's 5 degrees outside. Now, um, what is interesting about this scenario is that it doesn't account for um, uh, yet another factor that is uh, uh, commonly uh, applied in PV design, and that's what we call the temperature rise coefficient, which is a, a mechanical integration consideration whereby, you know, it's uh, depending on how your module is mounted, if it's flush up against the rooftop, the cells of your module may actually be operating at 50 degrees Celsius higher than the ambient temperature. Um, if it's a standoff at three inches, it may be uh, 30 degrees higher than the ambient temperature. If it's a standoff at six inches, it might be only 25 degrees higher than the ambient temperature. Um, but if it's like a ground mount or a pole mount where there's a lot of air circulating around it, it might only operate at 15 degrees higher than and ambient temperature. But uh, there's always, almost always a correction factor for temperature due to um, the, uh, the absorption of heat energy into the, the cells themselves. Standard test conditions is done under very sterile conditions where light is flat. You can measure voltage and power. Uh, but in the real world, modules are sitting out in the sunlight. And uh, that, that sun, that energy, that heat energy gets into the cells and heats them up. And the extent to which it heats it up is, uh, is, is largely a function of the ability of the heat to be carried away from, from the cells. So that component isn't in this calculation, but know that in, in, in design, you would take into consideration. And that's the designer's choice. What, what temperature rise coefficient? Well, you as a designer know how that thing is, is, is mounted. So, uh, um, and installed, so it's up to you to, to make a judgment call about what level, how much temperature rise coefficient to add. So anyway, 21.424 volts is our minimum voltage, so uh, 300 volts uh, divided by 21.24 is equal to 14.12, just like 14.12, so uh, the answer, 14 miles. All right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I got, a, I got a, um, a chat indicating send me slides, and what I'm saying is I don't know what your, <laughs> what your email address is. Send me an email, not a chat um, uh, request, so that I can capture your email so that I can know who to send the slide back to, because I don't have the visibility of your email address in this uh, in the chat function. So, so just uh, R Stovall, that's R S T O V A L at 
keyboard. And I'll send you this. Okay, on to the next class. Only jump back into the deal. Uh, okay. Um, there's not much I would change with this. We know the 230 watt SPC. Um, we know that 9600 watts is the maximum uh, recommended uh, DC input converter. So it's a matter of going 9600 watts divided by 250 watts. It's 41.74. And this, they went ahead and rounded up to 42. It still gives them a lot of penalties. Uh, this, this is a, a recommended, it's not a hard match. Um, so if you, you know, uh, and there's actually chances, place where you want a little extra capacity uh, uh, so that you can get more benefit out of your input. In any case, low altitude, coastal climates, um, uh, and, uh, well, yeah, and, and because as the array degrades, the you know, power available will be lower. So. They have some power clipping at the beginning. If you exercise your system just a little bit, um, uh, eventually, due to the degradation, uh, there may not be so much clipping going on. Um, when I think I, I'm referring to um, the array producing power and the inverter can process, but you don't want too much of that. But maybe a little bit at the beginning isn't bad because it's you know, long term. Your system, you know, may uh, uh, operate at, uh, uh, you know, uh, its maximum capability to not leave, you know, any power on the table. Okay. All right. And there's not much uh, I want to change with his explanation here. Other than to say, excuse me, um, it says what array configuration provides for the best utilization of the array and the inverter power? And the answer is three strings of 14, which is 42 mo modules. It happens to line up. Uh, this uh, uh, kind of is addressing that same, same issue that I talked about earlier with the Sunny Boy 3000 and 150 watt modules and the uh, the the uh, the fact that you don't necessarily want to um, design for maximum voltage in that system because in doing so it means that you have to have fewer strings. Um, uh, but as it happens, the maximum number in the string also allows for uh, the most strings, which happens to line up perfectly with the, uh, the wattage of this inverter. <laughs> so um, let's see. <clears throat> Yep, so two strings of 14 would only give you 6,440. Um, the location at higher elevation would favor a 6KW with two strings of 14 modules. Hmm, 6KW inverter with two strings, 14 modules. I'm not sure what the rationale is on that, um, how, the, how the higher elevation uh, impacts that. Um, so I'm not going to think about that too much, and we'll move on to the next thing. Okay. All right. PV arrays on a detached garage structure, so it is decided that a combiner box and disconnect will be mounted outside the garage accessible at ground level before proceeding to the house where the inverter is mounted next to the main panel. What is the maximum current of the PV power source and what size wire should be run underground to the inverter? Okay. So here they're indicating. Um, so this is, uh, all right, binder box and disconnect on the outside of the garage. 
and then they're going to run the conductors underground. So <clears throat> we uh, turn in the IMAX, which is uh, the uh, short circuit current. We know the short circuit current to be. Let's go ahead and hold this up. And I'm just going to grab some power. There we go. That's all that matters here. And I'll plug it in. Okay. <clears throat> we know the ISC of this module is 8.41. We know that we need to multiply 8.41 times 1.25 due to the variable level of irradiance. Um, uh, standard test conditions. Uh, 1,000 watts per square meter um, is the uh, conditions under which the short circuit measurement of 8.41 amps um, uh, was, was derived. Uh, but in the real world, we know that we can get considerably higher than 1,000 watts per square meter of a radiant uh, due to clouds, uh, due to high elevation, uh, due to, uh, you know, uh, white sands or reflections off of building or snow-capped mountains or all these things can contribute to an irradiance that is well beyond 1,000 watts. The NEC, for their calculation, wants you to uh, assume that you can have 25% more irradiance than standard test conditions provide. So, the first calculation is 1.25, okay? So, 1.25 times 8.41, okay? Um, <clears throat> times 3 is equal to 31.54 amps. Let me make sure that's right. That's an odd way of expressing it here. ISC times 3 times 1.45. Okay, which is 8.41 times 3 times 1.25. All right, so 8.41 times 3 times 1.25. Okay? All right, so that's, that's, uh, that is the maximum current. So now, <clears throat> so now we need to do a second 1.25. And this is due to, a, as Mike Colt was uh, discussing, uh, the safety factor for the wire, wire because this is a uh, continuous duty, um, uh, three hours or more operation, um, you size your conductors, uh, based off of uh, 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 1.25 times the maximum current um, uh, is uh, how you determine your conductor sizing and your overcurrent protection device. So you do a second 1.25 calculation. And in doing so, times 1.25, we get 39.4 amps, okay? And it says since the circuit is run underground, <laughs> 8-gauge will work for all terminal types. All right. I'm not entirely sure what he means by since it is run underground. Um, I think maybe what he's implying is that uh, <clears throat> there's no conditions of use that's going to be applied uh, uh, to, this, uh, to this conductor run. Um, but let's go ahead and, and go into the NEC and, and, and see where he got that 8-gauge and why it works for all terminal types. So. Let me just take a guess for this. Okay. Table. And 10. Okay, Article 310. Oh, maybe because it's in correction. Hmm. Um, so we're looking for Table 310, 15. Oh, there we go. That's based on 30 degrees. Sorry. Almost there. <laughs> okay. 
Here we go. 310.15B16, formally table 310.16, um, allowable ampacities in insulated conductors rated up to and including 200 volts. Uh, for not more than three current carrying conductors in raceway, cable, or earth, directly buried, based on an ambient temperature of 30 degrees Celsius. Okay? So he's saying that <clears throat> our number eight, right here, eight gauge, or number eight, is good for any terminal type. Okay? And we may be using, um, a conductor that has an insulation rating of 90 degrees Celsius, right? When we're sizing for um, uh, opacity of the conductor, um, while the insulation around that conductor may be able to tolerate temperature as high as 194 degrees Fahrenheit, which uh, increased current, increases temperature. So if you have an insulation that can handle more current, more, or more temperature, then you can have an insulation that handles more current. That's why there's a difference between the 90 degree column at 55 amps and the 60 degree Celsius column at 40 amps. Okay? However, um, all terminals in the electric world um, are either 75 or 60. Actually, I don't want to make that late in the blanket statement because I don't know for sure. Uh, but they're usually 75 or 60. I don't know of any that have been rated for 90 degrees. So, um, when considering ampacity of the conductor, we need to uh, typically choose from the 75 degrees Celsius mm -hmm. column. But, uh, and the problem, he's indicating that if it was a terminal that was only good for 60 degrees Celsius, that 8 gauge wire would work. Now, what wouldn't work is a 10 gauge, because a 10 gauge at 60 degrees, 140 degrees Fahrenheit, is only good for 30 amps. Okay? And the uh, 75 degree column is only good for 35 amps. The 90 degree column works because it's uh, 40 is above 39, what was it, 39.4. But like there again, while um, if we achieve 39.4 amps, the insulation might be okay, but the terminals themselves would be subject to temperatures higher than they were meant to withstand. Okay? That's the distinction there. Um, as it happens, choosing number number eight works for all three temperature considerations. All right. <clears throat> so that's that part of it. Let me uh, generate a new slide and jump back over to the next part of the question, <clears throat> which is, oh boy. <laughs> Voltage job. <laughs> All right. <laughs> fun, fun, fun. Voltage job. Okay. Now here is where having a Engineering mind results in a representation of the problem that looks like that. Okay. Um, let's see if I can't try to simplify things. First of all, um, at what distance does the wire run voltage drop equal 2% for the maximum operating current so that a larger size conductor should be considered for the wire run? Okay. That's an interesting way to phrase the question. Um, you know, how far can I go before I have to jump up to the next size wire? All right. Um, and the maximum operating current, the IMP times 3 is equal to 7.79 times 3 is equal to 23.37 amps. I'm all good with that. The uh, problem is in the, uh, in the solution set that they provide, He's given a nominal voltage of 240 volts, okay, which doesn't make sense to me because um, the nominal voltage of the we can assume, although uh, it's hard to know what the mind of NAPSEP is with regards to voltage drop problems because if you look back 
to the 2000 and the April 2009 study guide, they have several voltage drop um, uh, calculations uh, based off the nominal voltage of the system. Um, and, and, and in their explanation of the problem, they ask you to uh, utilize the nominal voltage of the system, which I believe the nominal voltage of the system in their example was always 24 volts. Except for one of the three or four voltage drop questions they ask, where they say, are there maximum uh, operating conditions? No, under maximum power conditions. And under maximum power conditions, they expect you, as the uh, as the NAVSTEP candidate, to understand that maximum power power conditions in their mind ask that you switch from using a nominal voltage to the actual VMP of the volt of the system. And use that in the calculation as well. Okay, so I am hopeful that if you get a voltage drop calculation on the test, um, that there won't be any ambiguity. <laughs> that there won't be you, you won't be confused by you know what they are expecting to use as the system voltage to solve the problem. Okay, um, <clears throat> and um, uh, but that being said, this problem, the solution that's provided in the problem, is not quite right. Because where does this 240 volts nominal come from? It seems that the uh, writer of this case study um, mixed and matched his, his, uh, his circuits. <laughs> He's got the AC side and with the DC side. He's indicated that there's 23.37 amps. Um, uh, in the system, which we know is the implies that it's the DC side of the system, so therefore we should be using DC voltages to determine uh, the voltage drop. Okay, so um, let's see if we can't somehow modify uh, his uh, his calculations here um, and make it right. Okay, so I'll go insert. Um, Object. Okay, we'll go Microsoft Equation. All right, and we'll go. We'll, we'll build it the way he had it. Uh, v, and then drop, and then we'll go equals two percent equals V. Hold on. Equals one of these guys. D. D. Uh, over V. Now. Okay. Equals. Rather, time 100%. Equal to. All right. Um, and again, two times B times I over one thousand feet divided by K feet. Okay. Times. Hmm. Some of the backgrounds are supposed to be using there. Okay. Okay. I think I got this. Uh, ohms. Omega over K feet. And then down here is C lowercase. <coughs> No. All right? Okay. I think that's right. Which means point zero two times V nom is equal to two times let's see. You know what? I'm not doing this right. Let me get the right symbol there. Two times V times. 
I over 1,000 feet over K feet. Um, time. Um, guy here, which is back it up one. There. Okay. Um, omega over K feet. It's like watching paint dry, isn't it? <laughs> All right. So. <clears throat> Twenty times two forty. Twenty times two forty. Point zero two times V nom. Okay. All right. So I'm looking at this problem and I'm wondering where's the twenty coming from? Anybody have any suggestions here? I think they eliminated the 100% by multiplying uh, It's actually oh, multiplying 1,000 on the bottom Got times uh, the 20, the time point of 0.02. So you get three pluses. So 0.02 times 1,000 is, is the 20. Okay. All right, so 20, 20. Times oh two something happened there. All right, twenty times. Okay, so <clears throat> v nominal in this situation. Um, uh, it's uh, the first time NAPSEP's uh, thrown a problem at us for voltage drop that uh, applied to a, a system that wasn't a battery backup system uh, off-grid type thing. The 2009 April uh, version relied on a 24-volt nominal system, two 12-volt nominal modules together in series. Uh, uh, so uh, this particular module is a, uh, would be considered a 24-volt nominal system. But um, I am going to discard the notion that they want us to use nominal voltage here and apply uh, a probably more accurate uh, conclusion that they want us to use the VMP uh, system voltage here. Okay? So um, I'm going to capture this in case it tries to go away on me. <laughs> Okay, so going back to our presentation here, or, or the, here we indicate, you can see that the VMP voltage of the module are, is 29.5, 29.5 times 14 modules, 29.5 times 14 modules is 413 volts. <clears throat> Okay, so 413 volts, okay, is equal to, to times D times 23.37 Amps times zero point seven seven eight ohms. Divided by P. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so one question you might have is uh what's that point seven seven eight ohms coming from? Okay. 
So we know we've already chose our conductor gauge of eight gauge for this for this run. Um, so to know where that uh, uh, value for ohms per kilofeet resides, you need to be familiar with um, uh, chapter nine, table eight. Okay. Um, of the NEC. It's one of the only things you have to go to the back of the book for. Um, table 8, and I'll show you what it looks like. We're on table 5. <clears throat> there we go. Chapter 9, table 8. Okay. So, <coughs> the way you use this table is you want to use the DC direct current resistance at 75 degrees Celsius. Then you want to use the copper. And then you want that to be uncoated copper. Coated copper is uh, this thin coated copper used, I believe, in communications. It's, it's not very common anymore. Um, but uh, <clears throat> so you want the uncoated copper. And then you also want ohms per kT. Okay? And then Depending on whether you're using stranded or solid conductor, you would either choose the one or the seven. Generally, the TV installation uses stranded. Okay? So if we look at the stranded, which is the number seven book, the seven plant, and an eight gauge conductor, we can see the, 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 the measure of resistance that we would see. In 1,000 feet of this stranded number eight conductor would be 0.778 ohms. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's how you use this table. Chapter nine, table eight. Copper uncoated ohms per kT, and then the, the, the gauge conductor over here in, in circular mills or or or, or the uh, AWG, and then you want the stranded 0.78. So now you know if you didn't before how to how to get those values. Okay. Um, back to PowerPoint. <clears throat> okay. Let me try to get that PowerPoint to go up. Okay, uh, going back through his problem. Uh oh. All right, let me just move this over. Double click on it. <coughs> okay, so going back and 20 on 413. Over two. Let me get my symbols consistent here as much as possible. Two times twenty-three point three seven amps times zero point seven seven eight. Um, Divided by heat. Is equal to C. Okay. Doing that calculation. <clears throat> we can go twenty times four thirteen divided by Two times twenty three point three seven times point seven seven eight is equal to okay. I'm gonna have to do this one step at a time. <laughs> twenty I'll do the bottom first. Two times twenty three point three seven times point seven seven eight is equal to okay. All right, so 
is in, in the uh, denominator. 20 times 413 divided by 36.36. Try that again. Two times three point seven times point seven seven eight is equal to thirty six. One more time. Two point three point three seven point seven seven eight. Thirty six point three six and twenty times four thirteen equal to divided by thirty six point three six. 227 feet. Oh, yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> you would need to go 227 feet before you needed to go up one conductor size to uh, not lose more than 2% of voltage drop in the conductor at this conductor gauge given this level of voltage. It's a very strange way to state the problem. <laughs> <laughs> do one little correction here. Hey, Richard? Yes, sir. Uh, we have Did a I question make here about the second uh -huh. and third lines of that equation. Um, okay. It just looks like once the values were entered, the line under 2 times D times I, 1,000 feet over kilofoot or per kilofoot, has just dropped out. I mean, where did that go? What 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 happened with that part of the equation? Well, um, it appears to me algebraically they were trying to um, uh, shift over the the equation such that we were left with just the distance on one side. Hey, Richard. I'm off. Uh, that's, yes, sir. That's the one thousand on the bottom that's multiplied uh, by the left side, which is the 0.02. That's what we said. Right. The one uh, side at the bottom is the side on the Okay, hey, you, gotcha. You multiply so, the left side, which is the 0.02 times the 1,000, that you when you flip it over, it's 20. So that's where that went. I see. Yes, thank you. That's, uh, um, okay, that, that helps. That is, uh, okay. Okay, that's clear. Thank you. Yeah, so that's that's because uh, somebody mentioned I, I asked where the twenty came from here, because um, you know when I took this test, <clears throat> I learned the two ways that uh, NAPSEP, uh illustrated their voltage drop for the previous version of the study guide. One of them um, uh, was an indication of um, uh, you know. Uh, how much voltage drop, or, or rather one solution required that you uh, determine the conductor size, um, uh, so therefore you plugged in the different resistances of the conductors to determine which one kept you below a certain percentage threshold, and the other one asked you to determine what is the actual percentage voltage drop uh, 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 from the question. So that's how I learned the two voltage drop scenarios. This is a different one. When you're talking about solving for uh, the uh, distance in feet and not exceeding a, a, a percentage voltage drop, um, I have to say this is a completely different way of looking at the problem from, from my perspective. So thank you for that clarity. That, that helps me understand this better. Okay. Next question, or next part of this question, case study, that was eight, all right, <clears throat> what is the minimum AC breaker allowed for this inverter? 
the inverter maximum AC current times 1.25 is equal to 32 amps times 1.25, which is equal to a 40 amp inverter is the minimum required for this inverter. Okay. Um, now, this inverter spec sheet, if we go back to it, um, we can see that it's a, what was it? A 7,680 watt inverter. Okay. So let's go back. Seven thousand six hundred and eighty watts divided by two hundred and forty volts is equal to thirty two. So it lines up. So um so now we know the maximum current that we'd expect from this converter. Thirty two amps. Uh but when determining conductor size and overcurrent protection, you multiply that by one point two five. So 32 amps times times 1.25 is equal to is that actually 40 amps even? 32 times 1.25. Okay. Well, in 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 choosing this uh, 40 amps, in in choosing this particular inverter and this particular System voltage. Um, there's a lost opportunity here because had this been something less than 40 amps, you would know that you need to size for the next standard breaker up, which would be 40 amps. So just know that had this been something a little less than 40 amps, you would need to just round up to the next standard size breaker. <clears throat> and uh, I don't have that code reference. There's a there's a section in the ADC that has all of the um, uh, uh, standard breaker sizes, and I don't have that on the top of my head. But uh, if I, when it comes to me, I'll be sure to tweet it in the Solar MOOC so you guys can uh, uh, know where to look for those standard size breakers and cheeses, for that matter. Okay, here we go. So that was. I might have skipped over something here. We'll see. All right. <clears throat> okay. Slide. It's only. All right. So, what is the minimum size conductor before considering ambient temperature or voltage drop issues? Okay. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we've already discussed this to some extent. What is the minimum size conductor? Uh, we determine, determine that 80, 8 gauge has a 40 amp ampacity at 60 degrees, 50 amp at 75 degrees, um, and uh, so uh, 10 gauge will not work in either case because the terminals of that circuit breaker, the terminals of the of the of uh, the equipment that you're landing in are not going to be rated for 90 degrees Celsius, uh, uh, while the opacity of the conductor at 10 degree, 10 gauge would work for a 40 amp uh, uh, circuit. Um, the uh, 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 the insulation would work. The terminal connections are not rated for 90 degrees Celsius, therefore it needs to be the next size up, which is 8 gauge. And we covered that pretty good. So I'm going to move on. All right, and the next one, <clears throat> how much annual energy is the PC system expected to produce if the system factor is 0.77, the daily average of radiation is, is 4.21, peak sun hours per day, um, and this one's pretty straightforward. I don't see uh, uh, much that we need to do uh, for correction here. Um, we've got um, 4.1 peak sun hours times 
365 days means that we're going to get 1,536 peak sun hours per year. Okay? So that's 1,536 hours per year where the sun is shining at the equivalent of 1,000 watts per square meter. So we <coughs> take the 230 watts times 42, and uh, uh, we get an indication of a 9.66 uh, kilowatt system, okay? Um, and then a 9.66 kilowatt system times that number of hours times the derating factor of 0.77 is 11,430 uh, kilowatt hours. Um, and I so said you can check that against PV watt. But this is uh, very much in line with the problems that we uh, worked out earlier. Um, probably, you know, a bit less complicated than what we did earlier when we did the uh, the retired NAPSEP exam questions. But uh, okay, uh, from Jen. Um, <clears throat> Why are there, well, uh, where do we get the 413 volts from? And I think she said this stat earlier when we were on the previous question. I'm going to back up. And so you can see the 413 volts. See this V nominal in the explanation provided by the guy is, is wrong. Um, it appears that whoever wrote the answer to this question, they were mixing and matching the AC side with the DC side. It's providing. DC current, the 22.37 amps, but then they go and, and have us factoring in AC voltage, nominal voltage of 240 volts. Does not make sense. Um, after some discussion, uh, it, uh, uh, we reached the conclusion that the, uh, the VMP uh, uh, voltage of the system, um, which is the VMP is a module at standard test conditions times the number of modules in the system of 14, equal 413 volts. So we chose to use 413 volts as the true voltage of the system mm -hmm. when calculating this problem. That makes sense? Because they made a mistake. <laughs> and Jen, I, I believe I believe you've been posting um, in the pvstudyguide.org and uh, you had some concerns, I think, with this problem for that reason, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? I think you're still here. Let's see who's here. Um, well, okay. So, moving back to the end here. All right. Well, we've uh, we've gone a little long. I planned to do this for about three hours study session. Um, I apologize for stumbling through this stuff, trying to build slide sets while going over these problems. I appreciate the uh, the assistance with the voltage drop calculations. They were always a killer for me. Um, I mastered the methodology from the previous study guide. I and pretty much forgot about it, really. And 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 I don't want to deter you from spending a lot of time understanding this stuff. But I have never ever heard of anybody actually getting a voltage drop question in that that <laughs> Just putting that out there. But it's one of the hardest things to kind of, you know. There was one on mine, but it had to do with doubling the distance. Oh, okay. That yeah, was, so. Um, that was a common thing people forget. They know that the bound mouth is mm -hmm. 300 feet away, and then they'll plug it in, and then something is where I remember it as related right. to the fact that you needed to know that the circuit then is 600 feet. Okay. Because it's. All right. So there was a, there was a question generally around the concept of a uh, voltage drop, whereby you're supposed to use the round trip distance to determine uh, uh, to plug in for the distance of the circuit, uh, but not an actual voltage drop calculation. So um, if you're not getting the voltage drop thing, keep trying, go get it. But if you never have it, chances are it's not going to be on a test anyway. So um, hey, hyper. <laughs> This is Piper. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> We're on a nationwide tour, teaching people all around the country about solar PV installation. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Broadcasting. <laughs> Snowy. Rich, that's Cassie. Rich. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
on uh, number eight, that round trip is uh, in the top where you have two times D times I. Okay. Round trip is uh, two times. Okay, let me go back. In number eight. So is it population? Two yeah, times when you have distance. that formula, two times D times I, that two is uh, for the round trip distance. Right, yes. And from your perspective, did it get applied accurately in this uh, equation? Yeah, it did. It got in there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 okay. it's fine. Yeah, the, the only issue was, you know, why they chose the 240. And uh, the, the only thought I had is that they might have opted for the minimum operating voltage of the inverter. Uh, yeah, um, right. And, and yeah, why would they do that? Why would they choose to calculate voltage drop on the DC side um, with using voltages from the AC side? And I, I, well, no, I not, just... Yeah, not saying it's from the AC side. I'm saying that maybe they chose that 240. Um, I, I only jumped in here when you were around number four, but... Um, what's the what's the uh, lowest low side of the DC voltage? <laughs> on How do we hang up? <laughs> yeah, we actually figured that um, in one of the problems here. But we figured that it was uh, lowest voltage that we should see from this system 20 years from now, after all degradation had occurred, um, and uh, and on a particularly hot day of 65 degrees Celsius was 21.24 volts. So 21.24 times 14 modules is something considerably more than 240. So um, right. I don't think what's, that we what's can... What's the operating range? What's the operating range of the inverter? Oh, the operating range of the inverter. Okay, yeah, I hadn't considered that, but uh, let's see here. Hmm. Operating range of the inverter. Not, well... Uh, we don't have an operating range of this. We have a nominal AC voltage, and we have a DC voltage okay. rating, but we don't have any specification. This is a made-up inverter. Right, but had there been one, uh, you know, we may have actually designed for the low range on the voltage side rather than the, you know, the middle range or the high range. Rather than putting, you know, calculating that based on 600 volts, uh, you know, in real life, we'd want that at, you know, a lower voltage. Well, yeah. Um, when you, you're considering a, a design element like voltage drop, so typically what you'd want to do is, is, is design around um, a, a, uh, a, a voltage drop percentage that's under the conditions that the, the, the system is operating at most of the time. Um, sure, yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> and and um, while the inverter itself may have a wide voltage range, the system that you're applying to it, its voltage range is going to be something narrower than that. So you wouldn't necessarily design a voltage drop calculation around the minimum uh, input voltage of the inverter. Um, uh, you you would you would if, if you wanted to be conservative in your voltage drop calculation, you would be designing around the minimum uh, uh, voltage production from your array. Because that's a, sure. That's I'm just that trying to guess it. where the where the 240 came yeah. from. <laughs> Good guess. I think I think you just made a mistake though. Um, <laughs> so awesome. Well, again, um, I'm going to check my email here just to confirm. I've got uh, uh, Daniel, Josh. Uh, um, but as far as uh, emails that have been sent requesting. These notes that we've taken during the study study session, um, those are the only two that I have. So, uh, Jim, I believe you asked if um, uh, no, it was Josh. Okay, yes, Josh, I got your uh, your email request. I'll be sure that you get a copy of that. Anybody else who wants a copy, just uh, send me send me uh, send me send me an email and let me know because I can't tell what your email address is from the. Um, well, you know what, I, if you. Now, you didn't have to register to sign into this thing, so you wouldn't have inputted your email. So I wouldn't know what your email address is unless you send me an email to, to, to let me know that you want a copy of this spreadsheet, and I'll be happy to send it out to you. I won't publish this because it's a lot of, you know, just random notes. 
Um, uh, maybe I'll go back and tighten it up and, and make it something something publishable on, on the site. Uh, but, but either way, if you send me an email now, I'll send you a copy of this raw PowerPoint uh, for you to do with what you wish. <laughs> okay? Thanks for tuning in, you guys. We'll see you next time.